is Nelson Olinsky, and I'm a member of your local Lions Club. Uh, fundraisers like this help us do projects like our upcoming back to school supply drive. Uh, we do a huge haunted house in, the, in October to uh, benefit the local food shelf. Uh, helps fund projects like that. And then uh, around Christmas time, we do stockings for the local schools, um, just in case a few people can't afford things like that. Um, this year, we're going to do uh, like a warm the heart uh, clothes drive and donate a bunch of stuff like that for them too. And then um, you know, around Christmas time, we do a huge holiday lights program, where we light up pretty much the entire main street in Arlington. Um, so projects like that, and you know, like our Easter egg hunt in the spring. And uh, we're constantly doing like food drives and things like that. And uh, we're, we're actually a 100% nonprofit organization. So every single dime that we raise at functions like this goes directly to those projects. So um, that's kind of hard to uh, find in nonprofits these days. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by handing out a gold pan. Um, in this gold pan, you're going to find some small specks of Vermont gold, which is pretty typical. Um, just take the pan and swirl it around a little bit, and you're going to notice that the gold itself is just sticks to the bottom because it's so much heavier than anything else in the pan. Gold is actually 17% heavier than anything else in nature. Can I have that microphone just a minute? <laughs> sure. I am so proud of you here. Nelson happens to be my great nephew, and we have come up from Georgia just to hear this fella. Now that she's completely embarrassed me and I'm probably going to have stage fright and crawl into a corner somewhere, I thank you for your attendance. So the next thing I'm going to pass around is what people commonly call fool's gold or mica. It's one of the, uh, the most, most common things that people mistake for gold. Um, just take the pan and swirl this one around a little bit and you're really going to see the difference. The mica flicks around almost like a fish scale and gold, if you, when the gold pan gets to you, you're going to notice it just absolutely glues itself to the bottom of the pan. Can you hand that to the first person? So um, in a little bit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk history now. And then after that, I'm going to introduce my friend Jeff Slade. Uh, Jeff, in my opinion, is probably New England's finest gold geologist. Um, he's kind of been a mentor of mine on that end for well, probably a decade or so. So let's start talking history. What do you have? Actually, I'm going to come around front. <laughs> So what I have here is an 1800s map of Plymouth, Vermont on the bottom. And on the top, we have mid-1850s map of the area of Chattagway, Vermont. Uh, in Chattagway, there was actually 13 active gold mines that we know of. Um, it was pretty amazing at the time. And the Plymouth Gold Rush map on the bottom, I've highlighted you know, some of the, where the gold was found. Um, and now why it's found in that area is because there's a really active fault zone that always is constantly producing no gold. And then about 90,000 years ago, when the Wisconsin glaciers pushed through Vermont, they actually brought gold all the way from the Yukon. And once they reached Vermont, they kind of did this power, power slam against our mountains, and they also deposited gold during then. So it really makes for like this perfect storm of gold prospecting over in like, Plymouth and Bridgewater and Chattagway and Ludlow. Um, I'll leave this map up front and everybody can take a look at it. Um, actually, I could probably just pass it around. So I always like to start with one of my favorite legends, and it's the legend of the lost Indian Joe gold mine. Um, Indian Joe was a local Native American that lived up near Stowe, Vermont. And all through the early 1800s, he would walk into his local store and he would constantly pay in gold. And just like in an Old West movie, the locals kind of caught on and their curiosity got to them. So what they would do is they would follow Indian Joe around all through the, the woods and along the rivers and they kind of staked out his house. 
and they never really could figure out what he was doing. He was constantly going down to the river and he would wash his dishes and he was always near the river. They weren't really sure what he was doing. So, and as they followed him around, they really thought what he had was a gold mine in the side of a mountain somewhere, but he never really led him to that gold mine. And lo and behold, what he was doing, he was a penny for gold the other time, right in front of them the entire time. Um, what happens in the springtime and during heavy rains is erosion takes all the gold out of the hills and mountains and it concentrates it in the river. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, as time went on in the 1850s, when all of Vermonters went to California, to the great California gold rush, there was a gentleman by the name of Slayton that came back to Stowe, Vermont. And you know, he was out you know, just playing around on the river and all of a sudden he looked down and there was gold. So he actually started a, you know, a, a gold mining operation on Gold Brook up in Stowe, and we still find gold there today. So it took 50 years, but we finally figured out what Indian Joe was looking for and what he found. A little later, and um, a little later, people started coming back to Plymouth and the Plymouth Five Corners. Plymouth Five Corners was actually Vermont's kind of lost gold rush town. It sprung up literally overnight in the 1850s, and there were placer gold mines all through Plymouth Five Corners and down Broad Brook and almost into um, the town. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Bridgewater at all, but um, there's a Long Trail Brewery right there. They were working all the way down into there. Um, and they found some tremendous gold. Um, you know, overnight, a school sprang up, a post office sprang up, there was you know, 200 residents all out in the brooks panning for gold and sluicing for gold. Um, um, it was probably Vermont's most active gold mining area. As you can see from some of these photos that I'll pass around in a bit, um, we'll start with the, the top, top right, I guess, I'm, depending on what right angle I'm at. Um, it was also referred to as Gold Miner's Glen. So this was Gold Miner's Glen, and here again was Gold Miner's Glen, and this was actually the town of uh, the Plymouth Five Corners, and again the Five Corners there, and they had such a lucrative operation there that they actually built this huge log dam, and what they would do is they would dam up the water during low water times, and they would run, run it through their sluice, and to the left of it is actually what's remains of that uh, log dam. This was the... Uh, like the water storage area. So it would have been where that log dam was located. And uh, we go back to the right hand side for the third level down, you're going to see a gentleman with a rocker box. And it, it's really cool that these, these photos survived. Um, and then in the next one over, you're going to see gentlemen working um, a long tom, which essentially was like a really, really long sluice. I mean, some of these sluices and long toms that they worked were up to a mile and a half long. Um, they didn't really understand gold passing technology at the time. Um, they had been to California, and what they really relied on was these really long sluices to slow gold down. Um, and again, there's a, there's a panner um, to the left of that, and a couple more panners to the left of that. And down on the very bottom line, you can really see just how active and deep they were digging in the rivers. Um, they were you know, 20 feet down in some of these rivers, and can you imagine doing that with a hand shovel? I mean, we have a hard time doing that with an excavator today. Um, and you can see where they were working under the bank and the next one over. And the last photo on the left is the remains of a grist mill that was also located in that area. Yeah, we can pass this one around. And a little bit, and a little bit. All right, so my son is also <laughs> excited. He's been dying all morning. Um, magnetite is what we call, refer to as black sand. Uh, when magnetite turns, it gets crumbled up and there's a rolled around in the river. And eventually, you know, we've all seen that on TV and some of the shows or read about it in books. That's what gold panners are really looking for is black sand. So he would like to pass that around. He's very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> So the next set of photos is, was basically the other side of the mountain from the Plymouth Five Corners. Um, this was probably Vermont's most famous gold mine. Um, it was ca first called the Rooks Mine. It started in 1884. 
And um, after that, it actually it became kind of the fox mine. Um, essentially, you know, the economy went to crap, and um, the the bank the bank that was funding the fox mine, it uh, it just decided it didn't have enough money anymore to fund it, so it actually went bankrupt, and actually then went through an auction where the mine superintendent at the time, Henry Fox, purchased it, and he worked it for probably another 50 years. Um, Henry Fox was a really cool guy. Um, you know, when people would hike up through and try to, you know, check out the mine and everything like that, he would actually hand out one ounce nuggets to them, <laughs> if you can believe that. Um, it, you know, it's kind of cool to imagine because, you know, the, the gold rush sign that's located at Camp Plymouth uh, State Park, where the Fox mine is, um, indicates that he, he raised $13,000 in the first six months of working that operation. You gotta remember, gold was $15 an ounce at the time. And uh, to, you know, in today's terms, that's one and a half million in a, in a six month period. And you know, we go gold panning there in the Plymouth Five Corners just about every single weekend. And uh, we still find gold in those same spots. So it, it just, it never really works itself out. Um, you know, one of the things, that when you first start, you definitely get gold fever. And you just get this eagerness in you to get every little speck of gold that you're gonna find. And you think you can get it all. Um, and it, it just never happens. <laughs> so it really replenishes itself every year um, as erosion occurs. And it, you know, the erosion breaks down the rocks and things like that that, are, that have gold in them. And it also brings it back into the river from the banks and the mountains. So as you can see, whoop, <laughs> this, this is Henry Fox working in one of his upper shafts. And this, uh, this sluice, um, you know, parts of it still remain. I was lucky enough to find the remnants of that. I have a few things that I'll pass around later from that. Um, this sluice was a mile and a half long. I mean, it's just amazing to think. And in that mile and a half, it was such a feat of engineering, he managed an exactly a one foot drop. Um, you know, to the left is actually the remains of that sluice. And then these photos are all of the shafts. Um, Currently, it's owned by a private landowner, and she, she shut it off. Um, I think she's kind of nervous about people falling in. Over, over time, people have rappelled down to recover you know, gold specimens and things like that. Um, so and it, it definitely is a little dangerous. Um, again, the next roll down is uh, Henry Fox again, uh, working those same shafts. And the, the Fox mine itself was almost like its own little village, and, you know, three miles up this brook. Um, so they had, you know, a workers, workers' quarters, and they had like a assayer's mill. Um, they had crushing mill up there. Um, it was really, really cool to, to, you know, to imagine. Also, when they first started, they started with two vertical shafts, and those vertical shafts are probably 300 yards up the bank. Well, they kept flooding, so lo and behold, they had to dig a horizontal shaft to actually meet those. Now, I'm not sure if we could do it today and the entire town of Plymouth and Bridgewater showed up to watch this happen. It took them months, but eventually they connected that horizontal shaft to the two vertical shafts. And honestly, it was like a circus at the time because I mean, people were betting on whether they were gonna connect them or not. And again, I don't think we could do that today without you know, laser technology. So it, it's really cool to imagine. You can pass that one around. So let's go back to the Chattagway, Vermont, which is just south of Kellington. Uh, it's, it's right near that Bridgewater Plymouth area. At the time, those 13 hard rock gold mining operations, they were all running their ore through this three-story gold crushing mill. So what they would do is they would start at the top and they would drop the big chunks of quartz with gold in them down through the rollers. And eventually it would get smaller and smaller and smaller until it was a fine powder when it got down to the bottom. So what do you do with that fine powder? So the latest and greatest technology at the time was actually mercury. <laughs> so because mercury is so closely related to gold on the periodic table, it almost acts like a magnet. So when you throw the mercury at the gold, it sucks it all up and it separates it from the rest of the powder. So, and after you're done with that, what you, what you would have to do is cook the mercury off. So they were using their, their dinner plates and their frying pans. And uh, lo and behold, the health side effects 
kicked in. So people were losing their teeth and their hair, and you know the science just wasn't there on uh, the effects of mercury on the human body. Uh, there are still some third world countries that use mercury. Um, it, it just, it's really, really dangerous stuff because the only way to get it off of the gold is to burn it. Um, I, there are people that still use it. Um, I've seen people throw it, you know, because every once in a while you'll get a piece of gold from the river that has a little bit of mercury on it. It occurs naturally. Um, and it almost stains it a white silver color. And I've heard of people blowing it off on their barbecue grills and just kind of walking away. Or um, another trick I've heard about is you take a tin coffee cup and you cut a potato in half, and you put water with the gold in, and then you put the potato on top of that tin coffee can, and the potato actually acts as a filter to uh, contain the mercury from going up into, your, up into you. Um, the problem is, after that, you're kind of stuck with a potato full of mercury, and you still have that, that hazardous waste to get rid of. You can pass that. So this last photo, we're going to go back to Stowe and uh, Worcester, Vermont a little bit. Um, at the time, this is probably the only surviving photo, and it's, it's the only photo I've ever seen. It just really gives you a kind of an indication of how big some of these operations were. You can pass it around. Um, I suspect that's Stowe, but the photo's labeled Worcester. Um, if it was Worcester, that would have been Minister Brook. Um, a lot of people still go there and find some really nice gold. Um, compared to, they shut this off. Uh, compared to gold broken and Stowe, it has uh, it has much larger gold, and I think it probably would have been e easier to imagine that sluice on uh, Minister Brook than Gold Brook. All the grab was out of uh, Minister Brook, so I, I bet they ran that right down the, that long time sluice. Yeah, it's been stripped right down to the bedrock. So let's talk a little bit now about actually locating some gold deposits. Um, in your instructions, there should be a copy of this and a copy of this. Um, so as gold travels down the banks and the mountains and it collects in the rivers, you have to imagine my latest and greatest problem. So <laughs> you have to <laughs> you have to imagine this square sheet of plywood as the flood period during the spring or during heavy rains. What the river will do is it'll jump its banks and it'll run straight. So once the river recedes after those heavy rains or the floods have kind of dissipated, it turns back to its natural flow, which is just like a snake. So as it flows, gold collects in those inside corners in the gravel. So as it turns, you can see this inside corner here, and another inside corner here, and here and here. So usually that's where I start test panning. You know, I'll test pan those little gravel banks or gravel beaches a little bit, and I'm gonna find fine gold there. So after that, what I do is I say, well, the heavier gold and the bigger gold always drops out just before that inside corner. So I start looking for flat rocks like these, because what happens is the river flows over those flat rocks and the gold drops out. So what it is, is the river slows down once it drops over those large flat rocks and it drops down and gold just kind of sits there and waits for us to collect it. And I'm also looking for, you know, bigger boulders, you know, in, right around those inside corners. And a lot of times, you know, we go to like Buffalo and Broad and um, there are people that go there constantly. Um, I bet right now there's 30 or 40 gold panners out there right now between the two brooks. So what I look for is I look for large boulders that are still on the surface. That to me indicates nobody's ever dug there before. Um, there's either bedrock, which is closely you know, towards the surface, or it's a hard pack surface. So the big boulders haven't sunk yet, and also it's a good indication that nobody's really dug around those rocks before. So we typically will roll the boulders out of the way and uh, we'll dig in those spots, and they're usually pretty lucrative. Um, who can set that down? So in your gold panning instructions, there actually is a copy of this for you to take home. 
um, I grabbed this diagram after watching the, the first season of Gold Rush. <laughs> I mean, by a show of hands, I'm sure there's, there's everybody in the room has watched Gold Rush at some point or another. Um, during the first season, they were chasing this old ancient waterfall. And the reason they didn't get any gold out of that ancient waterfall, because it was a traditional waterfall, <coughs> like this one here. And it just slopes down and gold washes right out. So it really doesn't collect gold. So the even older waterfalls that have had you know, water and gravel and over millions of years beat them up and kind of round them back towards, towards the back, that's where those pockets are gonna be. Of course, until you dig and remove five or six feet of you know, gravel out of those waterfalls, you really don't know what kind of waterfall it is. So that's where Parker ran into trouble. <laughs> So this, bi this bottom diagram is one of my absolute favorites. It's of the saltation process. It's this really constant movement in the river. If you were to stick your face down close to the river, you would constantly see the gravel in movement, whether it's after heavy rain or just you know, during everyday period. So as that saltation goes on, you know, the gravel and the gold is just rolling. And as that gravel rolls, because gold is so much heavier than anything else in the river, it's kind of sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. Um, you know, one of the best time periods is after a heavy rainstorm, where the gold really hasn't had that process happen yet. Um, and as you can see, there's some larger rocks located in the river itself. And a lot of times, gold will settle right on top of those. So it really doesn't take a lot to dig, because that gold thinks it's that hard pack surface or the bedrock that it's sitting on. Now, as you go down, you're gonna reach a hard pack layer. That hard pack layer usually consists of like clays and heavy stuff after that it has been pressed down over time and it's considered to be the false bedrock. And a lot of times that makes for the, the best digging possible because once you get down you know, a couple of feet, two or three feet, you're gonna start hitting that hard pack and gold is just right there on the surface. Um, that, and that's really your pay streak in the river. So, um, a little more education, um, like those flat rocks that, I keep thinking I shut this off. Um, so those flat rocks I was talking about, this diagram will give you an idea of how those flat rocks work. The river rolls over and all of a sudden, choo, it drops down. And then once the river packs back up again, the gold is trapped right in front of that rock. Now we can talk about placer deposits a little bit and residual placer deposits. Um, as erosion occurs, these gold, these gold structure veins kind of break out of the rocks themselves. And then they eventually, they work their way down towards the river. And the entire time, kind of collecting together. Um, in my experience, once a gold catch, always a gold catch in the river. Um, you know, we go back to the same spots every single year and there's new gold there. So every single time we go to those spots, we're finding new gold whether it's, you know, it's in the fall or the late summer or even early in the spring. Um, so it really collects in that river once it washes in into those gold spots. Now, what I did with this bottom photo, this is the, the Crooked Bridge. It's, not, it's just a little south of the Plymouth Five Corners. This is a spot we frequent a lot. Um, as you can see, it's a good, good um, photo of an inside corner. This area right here, we have, you know, we've been working that area for 10 years now, and there's always new gold there. Um, the river, this is your stony beach right here, and the, the river kind of curves back this way. So um, if anybody needs a spot to go, there's, and it's on public land. So, um, you know, that's another thing about gold panning is um, sometimes you have to knock on a door uh, to get a landowner's permission because you obviously can't pan their gold without their permission. But um, there are tons of public lands out there in Vermont. Um, there's probably, what do you say, Jeff, three or four miles of open public brook on uh, Broad, give or take. Yeah, so between Broad and uh, Buffalo. Yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of public areas. Yeah, so in, in those areas are completely open to the public, so there's no permission needed and then there's no over regulation on any of that stuff. Um, so if anybody wants to take a look at that. Okay, you can just, you can just pass this one around. 
This is the uh, Vermont Gold Rush marker that's actually at Camp Linda State Park. Um, they even have a, a private gold pray and there's a parking lot there. <laughs> um, people go there just, like I said, we go there just about every weekend on and off. Um, and there's, you know, there's always gold that's replenishing itself in that area. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start passing a couple more rocks around. This is an example of that hard pack area I was just talking about. It's referred to as river cement. Um, as time goes on, it gets just it gets so pressed and so stuck together that it actually forms um, like a cement on rocks at the bottom of the brook. And as you can see, there's a bunch of really, really cool <coughs> rust in there. Um, the old timers always said that gold wears an iron cap. You know, it comes out of the same veins that, um, that gold does, but it's a little bit lighter, so it settles more to the surface as it collects. I don't have the heart to crush that rock and pan the gold out of it, so it, it's more valuable as a prop to me. <laughs> now, earlier, my son Shane passed around a little bit of magnetite. Just to show you how heavy this stuff and why it collects with gold, I'm going to pass this around. Uh, don't be shocked. This is probably 15 or 20 pounds. <laughs> That's easier for you. So the next rock I'm going to pass around is this is straight out of the fox mine. Um, what they were doing at the time is they were hunting schist. Um, schist has these great little quartz stringers in it, and you can see again there's rust on the surface. So gold wears an iron cap. So what they were doing is they were crushing this stuff up and they were panning it. Now, the cool thing about this schist, it actually, we're lucky in Vermont, is we have the Great Appalachian Gold Belt. So the Great Appalachian Gold Belt actually travels up from Georgia all the way up through the East Coast and through Vermont and then on to upstate New Hampshire. Now, why do you say upstate New Hampshire? Well, there's so much granite in lower New Hampshire that it's buried way underneath that granite. So we, we really don't get to see it there. So the other half of black sand is actually hematite. So, so right now what I'm going to do is, uh, earlier I talked about my friend Jeff. Um, I, I really consider him the, the foremost expert in geology of gold prospecting in Vermont. And typically I get up here and I could talk about it a little bit and I, I try not to embarrass myself. but. Um, Today, I'm going to have him talk Keep about going. it. <laughs> My Aunt Jane's already embarrassed me enough. <laughs> Can people hear me? Thanks, uh, Nelson. Um, so Nelson left off with uh, passing some rocks around. What I thought I would do is uh, talk some basic geology. And uh, I brought some of the Vermont geological maps. Uh, these are the two bedrock maps for the state of Vermont. Um, you know, the, the one, the full map is, uh, you know, on the left side. The southern part of the state where we are is uh, on the right side. And uh, when we get into it, I, I apologize that people may not be able to see it. But what I did on the southern map is I actually put some dots on it and marked out some things, and we'll talk about that. You know, where the gold belt is in Vermont, some of the different geologic formations that are there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to start out talking about the bedrock. Okay? One of the first things that, you know, if you start prospecting or you've been doing prospecting in Vermont long enough or in New England long enough is, is there load gold? Okay, load gold is gold that's associated, and it's in the bedrock itself. Okay, um, placer gold is gold that's in the sediments. It's in the stream sediments. It's in the glacial sediments. Okay, so it's not attached to bedrock. Okay, and prospectors in the room that are prospecting Vermont. Al, put your hand up. 
<laughs> okay? Guys in the back, put your hand up. All right? How many of you think that Vermont has bedrock or low gold? Put your hand up. Okay? Everybody, right? If you've panned in the streams, number one, and you've looked at the shape of the gold that's coming out of the brooks, you've got little pieces that look like needles. You have stuff that looks like cauliflower. Okay? Those, those pieces of gold haven't been tumbled or moved in the stream. Okay? Um, they haven't gone very far. So they're probably pretty close to the source, which is bedrock, okay, or is low. Nelson talked about all the early mines that were here, okay? There's any number of, you know, I can uh, Fox Mine, Taggart Mine, McKinsey Mine, you know, again, if you plot them on a map, you're going to see that they all line up along certain geology, okay? So again, the old timers probably knew more than we do. I mean, they, they went after these bedrock gold deposits. So I think there's probably low gold. Um, if you look at the Wild Ammanusik area in New Hampshire, again, um, one of the larger, I think it's called the Dodge Mine that was up there. The Dodge Mine was up in there probably into the 60s, and it provided gold to the U.S. Mint. Okay? So, again, low gold. So, know the difference. Placer gold in gravels, low gold in bedrock. Now, talking a little bit about geologic history or geologic time. Okay? I wonder what um, the letter is. We've got mountains that are here. The center part of the Green Mountains are 1.2 billion with a B years old. The Adirondacks, 1.2 billion years old. Okay? The rock that just where it's underneath us is probably 500 to 600 million years old. Half the age of the core of the Green Mountains and core of the Adirondacks, okay? The rocks that where we're going to talk about here, like Plymouth area, uh, Bridgewater, up the, I guess the center of the state, up basically where Route 100 runs, those are around 450 million years old, okay? And remember that date, that's an important time in the history of the geology that's around here. 450 million years ago. Okay, something very important happened here. All right, let's step up again. Placer deposits, the glacial part of this, 25,000 years ago. Okay, last glacial age. Okay, we put a mile thick chunk of ice over this whole area. It bulldozed everything off. The mountains that we love in Vermont probably were. 10 to 15,000 feet high, okay? They got bulldozed off. They ended up, Long Island is Vermont. So I think what all people that are from Long Island and downstate love to come to Vermont because, you know, they're living on, you know, the, the mountains from down there. They come back, they return home here. That's what, that's what I think. But anyways, the other important thing to think about is major storm events. Irene is a good example. We had areas here that what had 18 to 20 inches of rain, or maybe not that much, but in an eight-hour time period, we lost interstate bridges, we lost roads. Guess what that did for gold? Okay, it was like a restart, right? Stuff places that we prospected, you know, that were 10 or 15 feet deep, you know, a, a section of the stream. You go back and look at it today. That's totally filled in, all right? So those big storm events, 27 flood, Irene, those things reset even, gold. Even 71. 71. And some of these hard pack layers that you're talking about in the, in the stream, if you dig deep enough, you can hit those. Okay? You can, like, uh, I dig on Broad Brook. I got a spot there. All recent Irene stuff, flood gold. I go down four or five feet, I hit a hard pack 
layer. It's like concrete. That is probably a 72 flood layer. And a lot of people stop when they hit that because it's tough to get through it. You go through it, there's more sand and gravel there. And again, all those layers are in the brook. And a lot of them have different things in them. Some of them have no gold, some of them have gold in them. So it's important to understand that time frame. You know, guys talk about, you know, they'll show me a picture of a piece of rock someplace and tell me that it's, you know, um, the glacial, glaciers did that. They didn't do that. What the glaciers did is they came down, bulldozed things, okay? When they receded, all right, they put uh, glacial deposits down, okay? And the, the names to remember if you're going to be looking for gold, all right, are things like, if you look at a map, a geologic map, Canes, Cane Terrace, Esker, those are all glacial-based deposits, okay? Things like glacial till probably doesn't have a lot of gold in it. It's, it's you know, that hard pack. So where you want to be looking is in those glacial tills, or in the uh, glacial uh, deposits, the, the canes, the eskers, those types of things, okay? Um, let's talk about the maps up there. I'll be here all day. Um, <laughs> colors or different rock types or different formations through here. One of the things that geologists do is they use formation names, okay, to make things even more complex. Right here, the, uh, probably the most dominant one or the one if you're going to prospect some of the local brooks is the Cheshire Formation, okay. So what some geologist has done is he's gone to Cheshire Mass and he's, you know, looked at the rocks that are there and, oh, you now he's written a description. Well, the Cheshire Formation, a lot of these formations, like Nelson said, they extend all the way from Georgia up through the Appalachians. You know, they turn the corner in New Jersey, come up through, um, you know, into Vermont, up into Quebec. They turn the corner again, they go up through the Gaspé Peninsula, up in, you know, uh, northern Quebec. They actually go up into uh, the Long Rain Mountains of uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. And if you want to even push it further, at one point, Ireland, Scotland, those rocks were hooked on. Okay, so that whole belt of rocks, you know, that Cheshire Formation, may be called something different down here, a little bit different down here in uh, Georgia. But again, from Massachusetts all the way up through Vermont, that formation is there. Okay, and if you've dug here or put a garden in, guess what? Those big round hardhead boulders, they're kind of pinkish color. All right, go look at Warren Brook. Go look at, uh, you know, the one that comes down, the Roaring Branch or whatever that comes down into the back. Every single one of these brooks that comes down off the west side of the Cree Mountains has that formation in it. Uh, Bristol, the cliffs up in Bristol, the white rocks, okay? It's all the same geologic formation in Cheshire. And guess what? The Cheshire is about 600 million years old. It has gold associated with it, all right? So if you follow, like, I'm going to throw some names out, Mad Tom, Warren Brook, Furnace Brook down in Bennington, um, the Roaring Branch, even up in the Bristol area, if you look at those brooks, they produce fine specks of gold, okay? And again, they run all the way up north-south, up along the side of the, the Green Mountains. Um, to keep going, here's the center section of the Green Mountains, all right? Bennington, Shaftesbury, Arlington, Manchester, Ludlow, okay? Um, Rutland, Cold River, all right? Woodstock. Right. Here's the gold line. Starts down here. Um, I prospected down in Massachusetts, Bernstein area has gold. So you know you can start down here. Here it is. Here's Dover. All right, South Newfane, Rock River. See the dotted line? Here's the gold belt. Keeps going up through here. Here's Ludlow. All right. Excuse me, that's not Ludlow. I think that's Ludlow. That's Ludlow. I'm not sure what I put on there. It's got an L on it. Here's where we get into the places that Nelson's been talking about. Fox Mine. All right? 
um, Plymouth, Taggart Mine, and I can keep going all the way up through. So that, that belt follows something special there, all right? Again, yeah, I can follow that all the way up into Quebec. All right, same belt. I can follow that same belt all the way down into Georgia. It pukes up gold. Okay. Why is that so special? I'm going to pass two rocks around to start with. All right. These are serpentine. All right. Just throw one in the back. I'm going to start one from the back. I'm gonna, what, what goes with serpentine? Anybody have to know? What else is in that? Okay, if I start talking, Vermont has talc, right? It's, it's hit the news because of cancer issues, okay? Talc's associated with the serpentine. I'm going to pass that around. Don't breathe in. Okay? <laughs> But the, but the, the, again, the real problem with the talc was this mineral right here, which is actinolite. Right? Again, they're all associated with each other. Those rocks are in a formation called the Mortown Formation. Again, it runs up through here. That rock's part of the upper mantle of the earth. Right? We're sitting on the crust. That's mantle rock that was down miles. So how does it end up on the surface? Tectonics. Okay. One of the things that you need to understand is that we had two tectonic plates sitting here. All right? And one went underneath the other. And if you come look at these maps, you can see all these slices. All right? Faults. The geology here is very similar to California. Same type of thing. San Andreas Fault, right? Guys that went out west saw the geology there, or some of the smarter ones. They came back here and went, scratched their head, and they went, geez, the geology of California, where we're finding gold, is a lot like where we are in Plymouth area. Okay? So they were smart enough to look at that. If you look at the, that early map you passed around, it shows some of those. Yeah. You know, they put the geology on there, so they were looking at that. Right? So, again, this line where the serpentine is and that Wartown formation, if you're chasing gold, you don't get anything else from my talk today. Right? And you want to go look for gold. Follow Route 100, which follows that belt all the way through there. That's where all the gold streams are. That happens to come, come and sort of coincide with that same serpentine belt, that same, same Northtown belt. Okay? Um, I'm going to throw a couple more rocks at you. And I'm going to sit down and be quiet. Um, again, in the stream, look at what's in the stream when you prospect. All right? Look at the rocks that are associated with where you're finding gold. These are more towns. The Moortown Formation is basically a, a, a mica schist. Okay? Garnets are in that. The little, the little red dot. Take a look at that. You go outside and pan today, take a look at what's in the in with gold. Garnet. Right? Moortown Formation. Turn it on its edge and take a look at it. Alright? It's pinstriped. It has iron with it. There's quartz associated with it. All right. Guess what else is probably associated with it? Gold. The last one. I'm going to show you one more rock. What do volcanic rocks look like? Everybody thinks of like basalt, right? Not in Vermont, not in New Hampshire. You'll see if you read the geologic um, the descriptions. Again, Ammonusic volcanic or Ammonusic formation in New Hampshire. You'll see names like greenstone volcanic. Okay? Obviously it's probably green, but not every green rock, you know, don't don't go by color. 
Take a look at this one. It's got speckles. All right? This is greenstone volcanic from the Amanusa. You're going to find this in some of the streams. Rock River down here in Dover, South Newfane. Right? This covered bridge there. You go in there, it's loaded with this. Amanusa, which is up here back in New Hampshire. Loaded with this. Guess what? Probably got gold associated with it. Okay? Um, I'm going to close by talking about glacial geology. All right? I, I, I'm a rock guy. I like rocks. I got a big uh, bag or a big box of it. So people want to talk rocks or want to look in there, go ahead and look through. There's, you know, a lot of those are gold related rocks that I picked up. Uh, there's a couple cool ones. I, I drew this on here. Uh, Mount Escutney is special. Cuttingsville area, uh, south and east of Rutland is special. Right? Volcanic. The rocks that are in here are unlike anything else that's in Green Mountains. And again, if you look at these, these are circles. Volcanic. Those are the roots, probably, of volcanic stuff that actually made it to the surface. Right? 1965, Charlie Dahl, who was a state geologist, they put down seven or eight four holes here. One of them hit a gold vein that was probably about two inches, maybe an inch to two inches wide in core. They hit that. Okay? So again, the source of gold. And again, if you look at this, here's, uh, let's see, I think this black line that I put in there is the Mill River. The Mill River has gold. This is the Cold River. The Cold River has gold. So again, there's the, maybe the sources. There are the streams. Okay? I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> I, 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 I can talk about this. Corner me if you want to talk more. I've got plenty of rocks I can show you. I've got rocks from different places if you want to look at them. I'm going to shut up and let Nelson go. <laughs> so, you know, Jeff talked a little bit of, well, a lot about geology. Um, you know, some of the other, you know, metals that are associated with that area, Jeff and I get in disagreements a lot, but I've found platinum in those areas. Um, there's a platinum specimen in the case. Um, you're also going to find a golden quartz specimen, a couple. Uh, one of those golden quartz specimens is from just south of the, uh, the Plymouth Five Corners I talked about. And the other is actually a nugget golden quartz specimen that I was lucky enough to find near the Fox Mine. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of cool Vermont specimens in here if you want to take a look at those. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to take pictures, any of this stuff. Um, I really am an interactive guy when we do these things. So handle everything um, so you really get to know and get familiar with everything. Um, Right now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the tools of the trade. So what I encourage people to do is look through your garage or your barn or your shed before you go buying expensive tools on the internet. Um, you know, one of, so one of my famous favorite um, examples is if you were to buy this on the internet, it's called a crevicing tool and it costs you about $15. Uh, we use these to scrape gold out of rocks and things like that. I bought this at the dollar store. It's, it's a barbecue skew. It's, it's the same exact item. Um, I just bent the tip. So, and I, these were five for a buck opposed to uh, $15 each. So, Again, I'm, I'm constantly trying to invent things on my own rather than buying them. I think it's a, you know, it's something fun to do. This is actually a gutter piece. Um, you know, as your gutters come down off the roof, it helps wash the water away from your foundation. Um, this was an epic fail on my part, <laughs> I will admit it. Um, I bought some matting on the internet and um, I put some iron up here to actually use it as a gold trap. Um, it catches gold, but within about three minutes, it's full. 
So it, uh, it was definitely an epic fail, but uh, I think I can definitely get another one of these and rework it a little bit. So we talked a little bit about the old timers using sluices. We have modern sluice boxes that are designed like this, and they're designed to just put down in the river. Um, you put two rocks on either side of this and a large flat rock on top so the water doesn't kind of wash it away and you feed your gold on this end. And the cool thing about this one is it's got this black matting in the front. So a lot of fine gold settles into that black mat before it even goes into your sluice box itself so you can see that you're actually getting gold and not wasting your time. Before I elaborate too much on sluice boxes, uh, the state of Vermont does require a permit to uh, use a sluice, and you're only allowed to use sluices on, on private land, which requires landowners' permission. Um, when you fill out that application, you have to put the exact GPS location of where you're going to be. The problem with that is twofold. Um, you can't move it within a foot. It has to be that exact GPS location. So if you're panning and sluicing in one area, all of a sudden you're like, well, the gold went away. Do I really need another permit? So the temptation to kind of move is, uh, is dangerous. Um, the fine for sluicing without a permit is going to cost you about $250. Um, there are plenty of sluice bandits out there in Vermont that don't, don't, uh, don't get a permit. But again, <laughs> Jeff's smirking. So Jeff, I, Jeff, I, I, I learned. I paid $150. <laughs> I thought it was 750. No, mine was 150. It's, it's how you answer those questions. You got to know how to answer the 20 questions they're going to ask you when they show up. So another great tool and trick of the trade is this is called the bazooka gold trap. Um, it is pure production. Um, you can literally take a five-gallon bucket and dump it into this end, and it washes down through, and anything smaller than about a half an inch, maybe five-eighths of an inch is going to fall down through into this gold trap. Now the really cool thing about the gold trap, if you look at the back of this, you're going to see where the river is actually not only washing gold down on this side, it's pressurizing this side. And inside that there are three little tubes that have holes in them and they transfer into the gold trap itself down into this area. So it acts as like a sprinkler system. So it's constantly act, act kind of actuating and, and moving the material around in there. And anything light that's gone down through washes out this little area here. So what you have left is pure concentrate. So you have like the hematite and the magnetite and any gold that went down through the trap. Um, this company went out of business and these things are actually worth more than gold. Um, it was bad business policy on his part. He was uh, selling them before he even made them and uh, he really didn't handle his finances very well. Um, this, th these things are invaluable. Right now, and originally I think I paid $150 for this uh, probably 12 years ago and uh, you can find them on eBay now maybe for, a, for $700 if you're getting a good deal. Um, So there, so there was a genius recently that decided to take that and he actually calls him the Reaper and refers to him as the Bazooka knockoff. Um, it's the same design, but he has put some grooves just before that trap. So again, it works as that, the same as that black matting that you can kind of see gold as it's kind of collecting down through. I'm going to warn you, if you buy one of those or you want one of those, buy the one that has the three tubes in it. Okay. Yeah. Get the bigger one of them. Don't. This one doesn't clean very the, well. The, the one with the two tubes in it tends not to have enough water going through the system to keep everything agitated. Agitated up. So uh, that's my word of warning to you. It's up to you. If you want to buy one? <laughs> get, um, get the one with the three or four. Tubes like the bazooka. So this is what's called a finish sluice. So once you've gone, gone through and you've concentrated your, da your material down, um, you can run it through this and it's kind of like instant gratification because you see the gold all littered along this black matting. Again, I always like to experiment. Um, what I did is I improved on this one. 
So when I got it, they had this stuff called miner's moss on it. It looks like a, you know, like a roll of yarn and you know, gold gets trapped in that roll of yarn that's, you know, and then the problem with the, the miner's moss is once the gold gets in it, it can't get out of it. So people literally have to take that miner's moss and set it on fire <laughs> and burn the ashes to get the gold out of it. The problem with the miner's moss is for a, you know, an eight by four section of the stuff, it's gonna cost you about $15. So every time you go out and you run your sluice box with that stuff, you're going to pay $15 again after you've had to burn it. Um, the metal I put on here is readily available to any auto parts store. Um, I've found rolls on, um, on Amazon. Um, you can get uh, t you know, probably four or five feet of it for um, around $15, $16 on uh, Amazon right now. And then the, the matting I use instead of the miner's moss, believe it or not, is an entry carpet to your house. I cut up the entry mat. And you know it, it makes for a gold, great gold trap, and you just wash it out when you're done. So a great alternative and very legal way to get around the sluice law is probably the, one of the best inventions that I've ever found. Uh, this is called the banjo pan for obvious reasons. Uh, the inventor, Mike Pung, um, he really came up with a great product. Um, it acts like a gold pen. You put your material in here, and you, you know, grab some water in the river, and you just wash it down. And it's not a sluice, but it acts just like a sluice. And then at the end of the day, you clean your nuggets out of this trap right here, and then the matting actually comes out, and you can wash that off in your pan. So um, usually you can run about a five gallon bucket through one of these before you, you kind of empty it out so it doesn't get too full. And like I said, this is probably one of the best inventions for a, for a Vermonter because you don't need a sluice permit or you don't need to get in trouble for being a sluice bandit. And honestly, I've gotten more gold out of this than I ever got out of any sluice. Um, you know, they're fast. Um, you can put, you know, four or five handfuls in this and be done under a minute. Um, it, it really, truly is a production. Um, you know, with the sluices, they're really hard to work when the, the water's low because you're relying on that water flow to kind of constantly clean it. So you'll, you'll throw a, you know, a handful of dirt into your sluice and you're like, oh, come on, come on, clean out, clean out. And you're just kind of watching and waiting. But with this, you're literally, you know, you're just constantly moving it. So it's really working that dirt and it's so much faster than the sluice and it's completely legal. <laughs> so again, I love homemade tools. So if you were to buy one of these with the name brand on it on the internet, you're looking at about $80. I went to Home Depot and I assembled this in the plumbing aisle for about $12. Um, it comes apart and I just use pipe insulation on it. And the cool thing about these is whoop, my nozzle fell off. So what you do with these, it almost works like, uh, like a dredge. You know, dredging became illegal in 96 in Vermont, but a lot of people still use these. So what you do is you stick it down, especially after flood times, uh, say in front of those flat big rocks that we talked about earlier, and you pull back and it sucks all the material, the lighter material up through, like your gold and your magnetite and your hematite, and then you turn it around like a squirt gun and squirt it into your pan. And it makes, it makes for a really valuable tool. Now, if you don't feel like assembling one at Home Depot, I got this for a buck at the dollar store. <laughs> um, um, these work really well. Um, obviously, it, you know, you can't suck up as much material, but what I did is I just I made the nozzle a little bigger and um, it works the same. I mean, it's got a rubber gasket in it and I use this constantly to suck material out of the river and honestly, you can't beat them for a buck. Um, I'll call after the thing and tell them they should expect a big crowd. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about gold pans now. Earlier I talked about classifying material. Um, this is a half inch screen and as you know, it's well loved and I probably have 15 brand new ones, but I'm kind of superstitious. So I, and this one has found me a lot of gold. So every time it breaks, what I do is I zip tie it back together. <laughs> I, I've had this now for probably 16 years. And uh, the best way to classify that I've found 
whether you're panning or sluicing, is you take a five gallon pail, and these classifiers are actually designed to fit on top of a five gallon pail. So what you do is you, you shovel your material into the top, and then you can wash it. Uh, what I like to do is I like to fill the bucket completely full of water. That way there's kind of water towards the surface, and then you can dump some more water in as you go. And you shake it like crazy, and anything smaller than a half an inch drops down into your bucket. So what you're left with is you're left with all those heavier materials, like the hematite, the magnetite, the gold, um, and some smaller rocks. It makes for really easy panning compared to you know, shoveling full, full loads of big rocks and things like that into your pan to, to clean it out. Um, these come in just about every size imaginable. Uh, like I said, this is a half an inch. Um, this one goes down to a quarter. And um, for even finer gold, this one goes down to an eighth. What, what size do you typically <coughs> find on the brook for gold? What, what do you think the most common size is? And, eighth and, inch. And, and what should you be using for a screen? Um, commonly, I like, I like the half inch, but um, most of the gold that you're going to find in Vermont is probably closer to that quarter inch screen. Um, you know, I always tell people, you know, even when using this half inch screen, always check for nuggets before you dump out all your big rocks. Um, I have found gold that won't go through this. Um, so you, you really have to kind of scan it to, uh, to make sure there's no gold in it before you, you go ahead and toss it back into the brook. I have found pieces that big. <laughs> I, I like quarter inch because again, um, if you look at again, look at the size of what's, what you're finding in the stream. Okay, if you're if you think you're in an area that has big gold, obviously you want to use you know uh, probably a bigger opening size so you're not dumping it. But in a lot of places, like again, this Cheshire thing, warm brook, you know. Kind of know what you're looking for. Okay, are you going in an area that's going to have big gold, or are you going to have an area that's going to have all little, you know, micro-sized stuff? And I say classify accordingly. Okay, I'm going to tell you most of what you're going to find to start with is probably going to be that quarter-inch minus size. It's a lot easier to take a pan that's got quarter-inch minus dirt in it and pan that to find stuff. That's my my I agree. So gold panning technology has changed a lot over the years. When um, the 49ers were in California and even when we came back to Vermont, um, what we were doing out there is we we're actually making pans out of wood. So we would take chunks of trees and we'd carve them into bowls and that's what we were panning with. Uh, as time went on, we started making steel pans. And what we would do out there is we really weren't finding a lot of gold. but you know, civilizations like the Chinese and the Mayans, they've literally been panning for gold for the last 1,200 years. So we were watching the Chinese that were working the mines and the placer claims out there, and we're like, man, they're getting a lot of gold. What are they doing different than what we are? So finally, we started looking at their gold pans. And they were using these metal gold pans because they had been dealing with metals long before us. And we also recognized these ripples. And if you look at these ripples, what they do is you pan, the gold bumps up against these ripples and it doesn't go out of your pants. So we're like, oh man. So we took our frying pans and we started beating ripples, ripples into them. And lo and behold, these days these are called Chinese ripples. So this is a copper gold pan. These came around during that same time period. Um, you know, during that time period, we were using mercury on all our to help gather the gold out of the out of the streams. And the cool thing about Copper is mercury doesn't stick to it. It sticks to just about everything else. So they would use these to pan out the gold that they had used with mercury. Now, there's, a, there's really a size and shape, and there's millions of different gold pans out there. It's really up to your personal preference. Um, this is a 14-inch uh, Garrett gold trap pan. Um, it's got a nugget catch. Um, these, these pans in the bottom, you'll see like a little indent in the bottom, and they're referred to as nugget pans, because when bigger gold bumps up against this, it doesn't even bother to jump up into these Chinese ripples. Uh, what jumps up into these Chinese ripples is actually your finer gold as you pan it down. And like I said, there, you know, there are dozens of different variations on these Chinese rippled pans. Um, 
because I'm always playing and I'm trying to find new inventions at work, um, this was called a vortex pan, epic fail. Um, I paid 30 bucks for this thing. Um, it, it's just, it does not work. Um, there's a lot of gimmick gold pans out there. Um, there's one called the gold claw where you can literally only shovel like half a scoop into it. Um, and they sell for about 60 bucks. Um, you know, these, um, you're supposed to use it in a swirling motion rather than a back and forth motion that you guys will learn later with the hands-on gold panning. Um, and to be honest, it, the dirt never leaves. So you really don't even get to see your gold. Again, this is a, you know, classic 49er gold pan. Um, and my favorite gold pan, and this is probably over 20 years old, is the Garrett Super Sloops. It's got this huge bottom on it. So when you're actually doing your panning, you can see more of what's in your pan and get a good eye on the gold before you lose it. And it has these huge catches. Um, you know, and these, believe it or not, are still made in America. Uh, Garrett's a great company. Um, and you know, on Amazon right now, you can get these for about eight bucks. And to be honest, this pan will probably last me a lifetime. And, and when I'm long gone, I'm sure my sons will be using it after I'm gone. Um, Garrett does a lifetime guarantee on these. Um, you know, a lot of the other gold pans are kind of flimsy, and if you drop them the wrong way or hit them with a rock, they, they crack and break. If you do that with this, um, you know, I, I can almost say I could run this over with a car and it wouldn't break. But if it does for any reason, they'll give you a free one. So we talked earlier, not to jump back on history, um, we talked earlier about some of the long toms and sluices that the old timers were using. Um, and this actually I recovered from the remnants of that sluice at the Fox mine. Um, they really didn't understand um, big ripples. As you can see the, the sluice box I'm holding, you can see those big drops in front of the ripples. Um, those are referred to as Hungarian ripples. So gold goes over and it drops. It almost acts exactly like the, what the river does naturally. So it really uh, replicates the natural process that the river does. When it goes over those big flat rocks, it drops in front and it can't get out. Um, so they were really relying on these huge sluices. Like I said, some of them were upwards of a mile and a half long. And you know, little fine gold would go over and catch, obviously. But to be honest, my theory is they were losing a lot of big gold. And you know the big gold would go tumbling, you know, right out the, the other end of the sluice box with the water and the heavier the other gravels and things like that, um, you know. And I've tested that theory, and I've definitely found um, in the tailing piles. The tailing piles are pretty much what's left over after they're done collecting coal, where they would throw all their garbage rocks and gravel and things like that when they were done. Um, you know, I've I've panned a lot of those tailing piles and around those tailing piles and found some pretty decent sized gold. So this is uh, an artifact I recovered from that same area. Um, it was a, it's a gold pan that's you know, probably 152 years, 100 years old, and it's heavy. Um, you know, I can't imagine working one of these, even this, what's left of it, all day. Um, if you can imagine, it must have been huge. Um, you know, at the time, I, I, when it was fully assembled, it, it probably was you know, 30, 35 pounds. So I can't imagine. I mean, these guys must have had huge muscles to work these things. So, I don't know if I can lift this up or not. So, again, I like to invent things. And um, I built this a couple of weeks ago for about 30 bucks. Um, a lot of people, you know, in like New Hampshire and out west, uh, you can't use them in Vermont. Uh, they're called high bankers, where you can just feed it in, and there's a water suction area where the water kind of cleans it out through and does all the work for you. Um, what I did with this one is I designed it to use a screen. So this screen sits there, and then what I do at home is I hook up the garden hose. So what I do is I, just, I throw my dirt in here and spray the garden hose through, and it all washes down through, and then when I'm done, I undo these little these bolts and I pull my mats out. Now, again, I, I absolutely love this rubber matting. Um, you can pick a roll up of this on Amazon for about ten or twelve dollars. Um, this metal screening on the bottom is called press metal. Um, 
most people use it for car grills, <laughs> but, but it works really well as a sluice tra uh, a nugget trap. So once you're screening down, the, the bigger nuggets will kind of catch in here, and um, the smaller fine gold will kind of come down. Um, and again, I love those entry mats with the deep ripples. So I stopped at the local hardware store and picked up an entry mat for about five bucks. Um, these days, lumber is kind of expensive, so I suggest that you use uh, any kind of scrap you have around the house. But um, I always tell people, don't be afraid you know, to invent your own things or look around the house before you go online and buy expensive tools. Let's so have over here. Um, so back when I was younger, Back when I was younger, a shovel would typically last me about a month because I was constantly breaking handles. Um, I've had this one now for about four months because I just, I just don't work as hard as I used to. I guess I'm getting old and gray. But a good solid shovel makes a difference. Um, you know, I bought them from the local hardware store. I bought them from Walmart. Um, I broke two shovels in one day from Walmart. Um, they make great artifacts for somebody to dig up 200 years from now, but I suggest really buying a good solid shovel. Um, a lot of people use metal detectors to go nugget shooting. Um, nugget shooting is, you know, working in the river and it's a working around the banks and they're metal detecting for those nuggets. Um, you know, I've tried and tried, um, spent hours and hours trying to find nuggets with a metal detector, but I have never had any luck. Um, so um, give it a shot though. These are kind of like a side-by-side -side for metal detectors. Um, they're, they're just a metal detecting wand. A lot of times when people dig a hole, it's really hard with a metal detector to determine really where the object that you're digging is in the hole. So people wave these around trying to locate that, fine-tune that location for that object. But what they also are is they work really well for kind of working bedrock. Now, you can, you can kind of scan the bedrock with it and it'll beep when you come to gold. Um, and the cool thing about this is it actually is good to about 10 feet of water. So if you're, you're feeling ambitious, you can dive down into some of the deeper swimming holes and kind of scan the bedrock for nuggets or larger gold. Um, you know, it, it's really based on your, your budget. I'm a, I'm a Garrett guy. Um, these run about 80 bucks. But, you know, this, honestly, it functions the same exact thing. Uh, it's only good to, you know, five, you know, four or five feet of water. But um, you can buy this on an Amazon for about 20 bucks if you just really want something affordable and, you know, to just try it at least. Um, along that same line of metal detecting, um, this is a Falcon MD-20. Um, these are used by guys like Jeff and I, because um, we, what we do like to do is we like to scan rocks. You know, we go looking for that rusty quartz, and we go looking for the quartz stringers and some of the geology that Jeff talked about earlier. And this thing will pick up gold that's almost naked to the eye. Um, it makes it a really cool little side by side of you know you're willing to play around for a few hours and to try to find those hard rock locations. Um, you have to remember the most profitable gold mines in the entire world, the gold is naked to the eye. So. Before, until they really pull that ore out and crush it up and pan it, they don't know if there's gold in it or not. So devices like this become invaluable to you know, hard rock miners. So again, I'm a Garrett guy. These run about 70 bucks. This pick, Home Depot, 12 bucks. Um, they work about the same. Um, like I said, always look for local affordable options before you order online. Um, like I said, they, they work almost identical. A lot of times what I'll do is when I found those, find those schist locations that I talked about, what I'll do is I'll actually chisel some of that out. Um, as when I handed the schist around earlier, you can tell it, it's really deteriorating material because it gets exposed to the elements. And gold actually also gets trapped in those little chunks of, uh, of the schist, not only in the veins, but as it washes over those, it just kind of drops in and gets caught. So these work really well to kind of crack that schist a little bit, and then you can pan out what you find in it. You know, again, 
you know, look around your house before you go buying expensive tools. Um, a basic garden spade is invaluable. Um, I use screwdrivers to kind of pick through some of those same uh, cracks in the rock. Um, this is an S-wing um, uh, geologist hammer. They're a little pricey if you buy them online. Um, they work really well, but this is a mason's hammer that you can get at your local hardware store for probably about half the cost. And to be honest, it works just about the same. So getting back to that fox mine, um, there's a couple of different stories that I've heard. The first one is they test panned all up Buffalo Brook until they came to the outcrop of schist and then they started you know, cracking that away and getting gold out of it. The other story goes they used the latest and greatest technology of the time and it made the, you know, made the New York Times that Henry Fox himself had actually used dowsing rods to go up the brook and then when they crossed there he was at that location so he started mining. Um, you know, I've had some luck finding gold with these before. Um, they're fairly simple. Um, I know there's several people in the room that can work with people if they want to try them. Um, you rest them on your pinky, and these are just copper grounding rod that were made into dowsing rods from Home Depot. So, you know, as you can see, they're, they're pretty loose sitting on that finger, but you really have to focus on what you're looking for. So as you walk along, as I get to that gold pan, I'm not making these move, by the way, all of a sudden, X marks the spot over the gold. You really have, if they do work, um, like I said, I'd be happy to show anybody how to use them. Um, you know, I've used them to locate water pipes. I've used them to locate water sources, and they, they work really well. Um, it's not a Ouija board. <laughs> um, this is an apple branch. Um, I've seen people find gold with this. Um, I, I cannot get it to find gold. I, I can find water and water pipes with it, but it, it's really, it's based on that same thing. Um, you know, I can get it to work on water, but as you walk along, I'm making it do this. It'll actually drop when you get to that water source. Um, you know, people are more than welcome to try this too. Um, this has been around for forever. Uh, people were witching for water 300 years ago to try to find water locations. So some of this stuff can be comical and some of it can be useful. Um, you know, take a look at any of this stuff. This is meant to be all hands-on, play with it all. Um, like I said, you know, I have some, you know, rocks, uh, gems, minerals from all over Vermont. Um, you know, there's a piece of slate there with pyrite in it. And right next to it, you have a piece of quartz with gold in it. So you can really see the difference. Um, when I first started these things about 10 years ago after Irene, um, I was a little naive and I was passing around giant nuggets and then one, one, day, one day I had, had somebody try to uh, reacquire one on me. So now I kind of keep a little bit in the case. Um, and that's really when this idea for these seminars was born shortly after Irene. Um, we, you know, we were out gold panning on the brooks and people were constantly walking up to us. And they were saying, you know, I watched a YouTube video, you know, I saw this online and I really wanted to try it, but I don't even know what I'm looking for. So, you know, seminars like this are really meant to give people a solid introduction to, so they can see gold, see how it acts. Um, there's also some platinum in there. Um, there's some larger gold and a few other rocks and minerals and gems that can be found around Vermont. Um, you know, if everybody takes one thing away from today, um, it's get outside and have some adventure. Um, I'm sure if I asked everyone in the room, did you see Indiana Jones movies when you were a kid? I guarantee a lot of hands would go up. I'm 44, so I'm sure my generation grew up on uh, the Treasure Island movie on the Disney Channel. And we, you know, we dreamed about going out and finding that stuff. And you know, hopefully you know, today, you know, some, of that, some of that wanderlust, you can actually go out not far from here and you can satisfy that. And it's really just about unplugging and going and having an adventure. Um, you can go to Lake Champlain and you know any of the slate along Lake Champlain, you can find 500 million year old uh, fossils. So I mean that's an adventure unto itself. You can go to areas like the Glastonbury. There's all kinds of ghost stories and horror stories about the area. It's uh, called the Bennington Triangle. It's similar to the Bermuda Triangle, but if you go there, there's all this really cool glass slag. 
um, you know, recently we cruised over to Herkimer. Herkimer is only two hours away, and you know, these, these are Herkimer diamonds. I mean, they're quartz crystals, but they're really cool. And you know, they're, they're everywhere over there. Um, it costs about 12 bucks to go mining at some of these sites, but it's, it's an adventure. You know, and that's what we all really need these days. We need to kind of put down our cell phones. And we need to get outside and have these adventures, whether it's hiking or using some of this stuff to go out and find gold. It just, it kind of refreshes our soul. Um, for me, I was really lucky. Um, you know, my Uncle Al introduced me to gold panning. Um, he had been doing it, what, 40 years at that point? Yeah. And um, his dad was actually an assayer for a company called Proctor Marble. So, and he had been doing it, you know, searching gold mines all over the world for, for this company for 50 years prior to that. He'd even been to, um, up to the Yukon. So I was lucky and hopefully I can pass some of that on today. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to break up a little bit. And we've got a gold panning station set up outside. Um, what I'll do is I'll probably take the first, why don't we say three rows. Um, I've got three bins set up out there. And um, you know, my, my Uncle Al, um, my friend Brian, and my friend Rick, um, they're going to work with people on gold panning. Um, in this room between you know, Jeff and Rick and Scott and my Uncle Al and Brian, you're looking at probably 300 years of a combined experience of gold panning and helping people with this stuff. So you know, they're going to work with you outside, and I'll be out there working with you as well. Um, so why don't we take those first row, three or four rows, and we'll shift you guys outside. Um, in, the, in the meantime, um, just a reminder, people can go through all of these props, play with them, look at them, take photos.